going to transition this over to Karen Ashford. So Karen um, is actually doing telehealth visits from her facility out in Stockton, California. And she was kind enough to join us today and share some of her personal success uh, stories with us. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been a crazy time and our outpatient lymphedema clinic at St. Joseph's Medical Center uh, closed down two weeks ago. And my administration has been uh, kind enough to allow me to do virtual visits to follow up with my patients because uh, many of them have been freaking out about what do I do next? Um, how do I continue my care? And so uh, I've been actually doing virtual visits for the past couple of weeks. And um, from that, I have gleaned information that I would love to share with you today. Uh, I would also like to just acknowledge that uh, there was a great online symposium yesterday sponsored by LEARN that you might wanna look up that was done by uh, Kathleen Shalou. And she, this was more oriented towards established patients. I'm gonna be talking about established patients, but also new patients, because many of my patients that I have been following up with had maybe only received one visit. And um, <clears throat> how, how do you manage the lymphedema care um, from afar? So I'm gonna start my presentation by just um, recapping um, the, the German gold standard for lymphedema treatment, um, complete decongestive um, treatment, consists of manual lymph drainage, um, various types of compression, initially bandaging and then transitioning into garments, exercise and skin care. So this is where we, um, we start when we're working with patients face to face. But how can we cover these components from afar when we're not actually in the same room with our patient? So we need to have a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to um, gauge whether our patients are going to be able to be successful. Um, what is their level of responsibility in their care? The more clear we can make our education, the easier it will be for them to be able to learn to do some of these things at home. And we want to make sure that their home program is as comprehensive as possible since they're not able to receive in-person care. Again, I wanna reiterate, not all of my patients I'm following up with because some, they have an adequate program to see them through. Others, it's just not working to, to do it from afar. And so uh, we may wanna look at other alternatives. Are there home care alternatives where we can actually get people in person? We'll talk more about that. So here's how I've modified. Um, this, is, this is my paradigm for the moment in terms of how I'm treating my patients from afar. And I'm using the conservative treatment model of compression, exercise, and elevation. And then I am emphasizing as much manual lymph drainage as my patients are able to do, definitely covering risk reduction, skin care, uh, talking about tracking their symptoms. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about pneumatic compression and the place that that might have in a patient's home care program. So starting with compression. Many of the patients that come to me from wound care are already in a double layer coban wrapper and Unaboot, but not all of them. And um, general lipidema patients that come from oncology and other sources may have not ever used any type of compression at all. How appropriate is it for each patient to um, to use different types of compression. And compression bandaging is very difficult to teach from afar and getting patients equipment. So I have tended to go more towards elastic garments and Velcro compression wraps, especially the wraps for patients that are in the reduction phase. And so what I'm doing with each patient though is to look at their current system, whether they have one or whether they don't, and do some problem solving with them in terms of whether it's working and to upgrade it. And I want to just give a shout out to the vendors who are just wonderfully stepping up to be able to do remote ordering and measurement so that um, I would, I would uh, refer you to learn to um, their, their virtual marketplace because many, many of the um, lymphedema um, garment vendors are offering this virtual service. 
exercise is something that is a very critical component of any lymphedema program. And with our patients in quarantine, how are they going to be able to compensate for not being able to go outside if the weather is inclement, not being able to go to a gym? And so I um, basically am looking at um, three areas. I'm looking at range of motion and um, my post-surgical patients, my wound care patients, um, do they have adequate range of motion? And that's something that we can definitely work on um, and I have worked on over video in terms of me demonstrating and then being able to watch them perform exercises. Walking is a very, very critical exercise for all patients, I believe. And um, we have a wonderful video that we're gonna be giving you a link to by my friend and colleague, Leslie Bell, who is a DPT owner of Timberlake Physical Therapy, um, a lymphedema therapist for a zillion years. And she talks a lot about um, just getting people out, even if they're walking around the house for 20 or 30 minutes, doing laps and being able to um, get heart rate up, moving, using the, the muscle pump action to really help with um, managing lymphedema. She also discusses breathing and has some great um, ideas for that. So elevation is something that I think is maybe more critical for our lower extremity patients, but certainly I look at it with my upper body patients. I have this little um, graphic here of the, the just say no to recliner chairs that put the feet way lower than the heart and the head. And many of my lower extremity patients use this as their home environment because of comorbidities of COPD, back pain, um, sleep apnea, they may find that that sleeping in an elevated position helps these conditions, but it certainly doesn't help the lymphedema. So we need to take a look at compensating through bolsters, pillows, seeing if we can get those legs up and getting more exercise and seeing if there's any way to transition to a bed, maybe a hospital bed, finding a way to um, get out of a position that basically has the legs dependent 24 hours. Manual lymph drainage is, I think, a very, very important area for lymphedema. And I've broken it into two sections. So we've got basic where we're stimulating the regional lymph node groups. And again, a shout out to Leslie in the video that you're gonna get a link to. She does a really wonderful job of giving people a quick and easy um, regional lymph load um, manual lymph drainage that is good for anybody to do throughout the day. I do teach manual lymph drainage over the video, and um, that's uh, something that is tailored to each patient, so I'm not gonna talk about it in detail, but it's something where I think that um, it's something, oops, I think we need to go forward here. There, other direction. There we go, okay. So um, in terms of the tailored manual lymph drainage, we start with the regional lymph nodes and I'd like to acknowledge Gunter Close for sharing this image with me. And it beautifully illustrates the cervical and axillary and inguinal lymph nodes. And I refer to this with every single patient that I treat on the very first visit. I educate them about lymphatic anatomy. I talk to them about the importance of stimulating the entire lymphatic system. And so um, this is something that I believe patients should be doing throughout the day and then doing their more expanded, tailored manual lymph drainage um, as well. Risk reduction. I actually have been adding COVID-19 risk reduction because many of my patients don't have current information about what symptoms are and um, best practices. So we spend a little bit of time talking about that and how important it is to wear a mask if they're going out in public, to use um, hand sanitizers, to avoid going out except for essential medical visits or to get food. And um, so that's an important risk reduction that we're adding in this um, time of quarantine. I talk a lot about lymphedema risk factors and um, with, especially with my lower extremity patients, cellulitis risk factors and discuss skin care and the importance of that.
I also talk about the identification of cellulitis. And this is something where I haven't caught a case over um, video yet, but because we have the ability to look at our patient's skin, um, this is something that um, I have surveillance over my patients. Speaking of tracking, I want to um, make sure that you're aware of the LymphaTrack program, which is a wonderful program that patients can download free to their smartphone and they can enter their symptoms and home program and send the data to me so that I can see, okay, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Um, what are the results? And they can track every day, they can track once a week. Really, we can determine the frequency together, but it's a very great surveillance system. So this just shows um, the symptoms that can be monitored. You can have patients measuring. I teach self-measurement to my patients so that they can monitor and uh, looking at their skin color, their pain level, wound size, weight, and if they're having any falls. These are all real important things to track. And then in terms of their home program, looking at the frequency of doing manual lymphatic drainage, using compression garments, using pneumatic compression, and their daily activity level. And on the left, you can see some graphs. So it's really something that I would encourage you to check out. So pneumatic compression is a great adjunct to the home program. I would never start with it. I would definitely start with CDT, with conservative treatment, with you know, having a good basis for home program. But pneumatic compression is the bigger gun that I pull in when patients need something that's gonna help them prevent cellulitis and wounds. If they need something that is easier for them to use, because some of my patients have difficulty doing self-MLD. We found that it has a very high compliance rate and reduces healthcare costs. So there's a lot of advantages. Something that really caught my attention is that patients with lymphedema are 71 times more likely to develop cellulitis than those without, and that the use of pneumatic compression decreases cellulitis incidence. In terms of venous-like ulcers, there's also studies showing the acceleration of wound healing, decreased swelling, decreased wound circumference. So it's, uh, pneumatic compression is a very good adjunct for, for these conditions. And just in general, pneumatic compression uh, has high compliance, high ease of use. If you have a patient that has limited range of motion, strength or dexterity, if they have pain, if they don't have a lot of caregiver support or if they have profound damage, then they're going to be more successful with pneumatic compression than um, being able to do manual work. Also, the reduction of healthcare costs is important to note. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of how we treat patients when we can't actually physically have them in front of us. And I've broken it down to three categories. We've got new patients that have not had any previous care. We've got patients who have maybe only just started care. They've been coming less than a month and then established patients. So with new patients, they need education from the very, very first visit. They need to have a good tailored home program that is going to reduce their risk for both cellulitis and lymphedema. They need however many visits they need. They may need multiple visits to be able to work out the bugs, especially remotely. And as I said earlier, the home health option, if you have home health available that specializes in lymphedema, for new patients especially, having that face-to-face, hands-on is so important. I think it's very challenging and it's, it's difficult for all patients to be able to start remotely. So if there's any way to start them hands-on, that's best. In the initial phase, in the first um, month or so, you've got a home program that you're establishing. Every visit, you're reassessing it, you're upgrading it, and giving them tools as appropriate to compensate for the hands-on care that you're unable to give, um, and then continuing to follow up by troubleshooting, reinforcing, and expanding their education, and continuing to modify as their needs change. With established patients that have been coming for over 28 days, and if they continue to have uncontrolled swelling, they may be candidates for pneumatic compression. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that option. And so the key for qualifying patients for pneumatic compression is 28 days of documented conservative treatment, which is elevation, exercise, and compression. And the documentation also needs to reflect if the conservative treatment is effective or if there's continued uncontrolled swelling. I had a, a virtual visit on Saturday with a patient who was able to do a pitting test through her video. So I was able to time and um, document that her right foot and right anterior lower leg had four plus pitting edema despite strict adherence to conservative treatment. And on her left side, it was three plus. So that's pretty powerful, strong documentation that her program was inadequate to control her swelling and that she needed the upgrade of pneumatic compression. This is just an example of a patient that is in my caseload that came to me and she looked like she did on the left photo. Um, she was, um, had already had an established CDT treatment. She had a wrap for her thigh. She's post-thrombotic syndrome. And um, she's somebody that I introduced pneumatic compression. And you can see on the right that not only has her left leg um, deflated, but you can see both ankles. She has um, CVI in addition to the post-DVT. So um, this is an example of somebody who, despite the excellent home program, it was not meeting her needs and she needed something more aggressive and pneumatic compression was able to provide her with that. So at this point, um, we want to let you know that there is another seminar coming up um, in a couple of weeks focusing on wound care. And there's information on how to register for that. And then do we have any questions?